It is the test on us, whether we are part of it or on the side. The worst enemies of Islam, it's the Muslims. It's the way we behave, the way we react. And this media look for that opportunity to exploit it and say, well, these are the Muslims behaving. And if we remain on the side, thinking that others will do the work, and we will be free from it, then we are living in a mistaken world. Question from the sisters, please, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, brother. But my question is that, as we all know, freedom of speech is given as a right to the journalist and the writers. So what are the limits for this freedom of speech? Are there any limits for it? Of course, sister. Freedom of speech is not, in its absolute sense, any way of the world. Even under the Indian Constitution, I think it's the Article 10 or Article 12, which was applied in 1988 to ban the books at any verses because it says freedom of expression, yes, but the issues of morality, issues of um, other aspects needs to be brought in. There is a part of it as well. So there is never freedom of expression to in the absolute sense. And this is the argument we are using all the time. That yes, you know, we understand and respect that everybody has to say, but at the same time, we have to understand what is right. So yes, the answer is simple, that there are always limits. There is never an absolute case. There are laws in different parts of the world. As I mentioned earlier, the issue is law of defamation, libel laws that restricts you. You can't defame a person's family, a living person. The laws will take you to the courts. Sadly, there is a concerted attempt to ensure law on vilification or sacrilege is not adopted. The Muslim countries in the OIC did pass a resolution to put a convention on uh, vilification on Muqaddasat at the UN. Some progress has been made, but until today, we do not have an international convention like the International Convention on Human Rights and other conventions that are in place. That should be the ultimate aim of us. So that, inshallah, will give us some protection. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Talat. I am from Nagpur. My question is, what is the punishment of sacrilege in Sharia? And we have the Muslim law in India. So which Indian Muslim group went to Supreme Court of India or which international group went to World International Court against maybe Taslima Nasreen or Salman Rajdi? Well, brother, as I mentioned earlier on, that I'm not a scholar, neither in law or in Islam, but I know in certain, for example, in the UK, where I come from, yes. We have heard from different fatwas. That's why I'm asking, what does Sharia guides? Well, I mean, the issue of Shatamun Nabi, which is the denigrating the personality, the personality of the Prophet is indeed a capital offense as far as the consensus, the ijma of the ulama are concerned. But this is an issue that can only be tried in a Muslim jurisdiction. There are clear issues. Even in Islamic country, when someone commits an act of sacrilege, Shatim nabi you know, there are processes that goes by. And, you know, Islam's issue of justice is, is very strong and very clear. And therefore, I cannot comment much because I'm not really aware of the internal, but generally, by and large, in the Western secular countries, there is no such protection against uh, blasphemy at the moment. Jazakallah. Question from the sisters, please. My name is Tanzi Lalapur and I'm a student. Is, my question is that, is it because of the Zionists and the USA that there are always puppet regimes as the head of Muslim countries? Well, I think that, uh, the, when the Muslim leadership is weak and when Muslim countries do not have the faith in their own religion, in the creator, in the holy book, as a source of direction, as a source where it gives them protection. 
and they turn, then of course Allah says very clearly that if you are not closer to me, if you do not want to hear what I have to say, then of course you at your own pearl. And we have seen the suffering, the pain, the humiliation of many of our Muslim countries. And it's a matter of time. We have seen that over a period of time, the same regimes are no longer there. And we hope and pray that it is important that the Muslim countries adhere to the teachings of Islam, not just for the success of their own countries, but for the unity of the Muslim Ummah around the world. Jazakallah. Next question from the brothers. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Muhammad Shafiuddin. Brother, can you confirm me the authenticity of the news which I read a few days before that in the UK, there are non-Muslim brothers are coming for their dispute in respect of commercial settlement and family domestic violence, coming for the solution to the Sharia committee for their solutions. How far it is, this news is correct. Yes, there is some truth in that. Day by day, the strength is increasing. More and more are coming. Yeah. You see, there are various tribunals and arbitrations that take place. Within the law, a provision is given. And um, we have seen that under the Islamic finance, for example, um, Islamic banks have been established where non-Muslims are now preferring to take their bank and facilities under the Islamic Bank because of the ethical system of finance that is there. Likewise, on the, the family disputes, there is a provision within the law that we have to stick to the main law of the country. But like the Jews, they have been given the right to arbitrate and within the teachings of their faith, the Islamic laws can be applied in terms of the family disputes as well. And yes, there have been cases, but of course, when the scholars are dealing with it, you need to be clear whether how applicable it is to a Muslim and non-Muslim as well. So that I can, I'm not able to answer. But point in principle is yes, that issues of fairness, issues of justice, issues of ethical, and that's in a way we deal with it. There are people who do come to that area. Yes. Next question from the sisters, please. Assalamu alaikum, brother. I am Yasmin Khan. I'm a lecturer in physics. In India, Muslims are made to feel apologetic about two, uh, two or three things. We have taken care of satanic verses and uh, one more thing that is the Shah Banu case. But in India, when we go for Hajj pilgrimage, there is a subsidy which the government gives. So for that subsidy, all the non-Muslims make the Muslims feel apologetic about it that, okay, the government is paying you money to carry on with your religious activities. Shah Banu case and the satanic verses, the ulimas have taken care of it. But as far as this issue is concerned, that is no one is coming forward to protest that you are not supposed to pay for going for Hajj pilgrimage. So how do we go about it? That is, if we want to go for pilgrimage, how do we, I mean, we have to take the subsidy and go. Well, sister, I cannot directly comment on that particular issue of Hajj subsidy that has been given to Muslims. But I think the key point that you raised about being apologetic, this is another tragedy of the Muslim community, that at times we bend backwards to try to prove the point of a clear point, of a point of justice of, you know, of without any doubt, is there. When we are attacked, you cannot, you are the person who has been attacked. So I'm the one who has been oppressed. The oppressor is there. Sometimes being apologetic in the way as though you're trying to defend your faith, well, you know, but it was done at that time, the religion of laws were passed 1400 years ago and this and that. You are, not just disheartening your own iman in many ways, but the message that goes across to the Muslim community, we suffer in the collective um, manner. You know, our deen is so strong that we have to be firm and clear where we stand. What is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. And if we are defending the honor and the integrity of the Prophet Sallallahu we must be firm and clear about it. There's no shame in doing it. You know? And we have found that the more clear, the greater respect we get is when we are honest to ourselves and particularly honest to our creator. So, as citizens of the country, you know, there are certain rights you have. We are taxpayers in this country. And I'm not sure whether this is a privilege given to Muslims only or when people of other faiths have their own other events. It's given to all faiths. It's given to all faiths. So fine, so you are part of the citizens of the nation. 
and you have got the same right in terms of your tax paying and whatever in UK for example we had the same situation where our British government assists us in sending a Hajj delegation so we have got a Hajj delegation in the UK sponsored by the Foreign Office government pays for it we don't pay but we the who judge from the UK benefit so there's nothing wrong with it we pay tax like any of the people pay it is benefit for the, because when we come up we are hopefully haven't got any illnesses the doctors have looked after us so when we come back we will not spread any other viruses in the country it is in the interest if the does, government doesn't support us we will still go there and we'll perform our Hajj but when we come back we may bring in other viruses or others and the society may suffer so you know they've got their own interest what they're doing and this is part of a norm in a civilized society that you respect and provide protection and support to all the citizens irrespective of the faith cultural or ethnic background thank you sir the prodigy die of islam farif nai I challenge any human being to point out a single fundamental of Islam. The illustrious son of the world famous narrator of Islam, Dr. Zakir Naik. Ek kabraham duta naste. Bhagwan ek hi hai, dursa nahi hai, nahi hai, nahi hai, zara bhi nahi hai. Motivating towards the true path. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. With his thrilling words and inspirational temperament, demanding dowry from the would-be bride is completely prohibited in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the one endowed with knowledge and wisdom. I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Join Farikh Naik appearing in Teams Star every Friday at 7 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Islam, the religion of natural instinct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forbid anything from human beings unless it's hurting them. Be the Muslim who lives between al hawf wal rija Be the one who lives between fear of the hellfire and lives with the hope of Jannah. We should do our best to show the most affection and love for our children and for children in general. Do not argue with the people of the book except in ways that are best. Oh believers, why are you saying things that you don't do? It is most hated in the sight of Allah that you say something that you don't do. A believer would know and a believer would inspire you and encourage you and inform you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins. Know the only path to salvation. Watch the spirit of Islam tomorrow at 4 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 5 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Where truth is hidden, misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulate scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth and who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik, next on Peace TV. Question from the brothers, please. Sir, I am Jean W. Lone from the state of Jammu and Kashmir. I have a question. Satanic verses sacrilege started from the misinterpretation of the Surah Najm in Holy Quran. And thereafter, your good self stated 
that sacrilege in any case is unacceptable in each society and it must be so. But we see that Salman Rushdie, or for that matter, Ms. Taslima Nasreen is all okay moving here and there. Even Muslims are not being permitted to take them to the courts of the law because they have the shelter some way or the other. My question is that where should be the bottom line for such cases? Is there any agency in UK, uh, especially those of Muslims, who wish to take Mr. Rusdi to the court and decide the matter for the common benefit? Thank you. First of all, you have raised two issues. Rushdie has mentioned that it was a book of fiction. If you study the book of fiction, you find the references to the verses relating to historical time, and our ulamas have very clearly come up that this is nothing new. In the past, Orientalist others have used the same verses in trying to give different message. So as far as theologically is concerned, of course, he himself said it's a fiction. There was no reference to any religious um, authority or book or whatever. But in terms of the... But they say that every fiction is a true story. Yeah, well, I mean, references were given, and that's where the whole dispute occurred, because he was using those names and in a very derogatory manner. But the point is that he was challenged in the court of law, and there was a legal action that was taken against the book. But unfortunately, because the issue of Islam was not recognized under the British law, or the law of blasphemy did not give protection to Islam, there was nothing could be done. The court said, the law of blasphemy gives protection to Anglicans only. And that is the reason why the campaign by the UK Action Committee at that time, and subsequently, we have been all been campaigning that the law of blasphemy should be abolished, and a new law on vilification should be applicable for all the faiths as well. So of course, then we will take the, the culprit to the court of law and hopefully seek redress. Thank you. Question from the sisters, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Huma Sheikh and I'm in grade eight. My question is, what fundamental principles and morals does the Ummah lack which enables outside forces to perform acts of vilification and nothing constructive or unified is done about it? Yes, I think it's a very, very, very good question. When the opposition or the Islamophobes look at the state of the community, and when they see we are weak, they pounce on us. And in 1988, when this book was commissioned, the state of the affairs of the Muslim community in Britain and in many other non-Muslim countries was, if I would say, not strong. We were a scattered community, no centralized understanding of issues, and anybody who could attack us or create mischief would get away. Because unless there is a concerted attempt, a concerted effort, then the people who are you know, the culprits who want to attack will think twice. The best example I can give you is the Jewish community in the UK. Very well organized, very well funded, very well resourced, well represented in the parliament, well represented in the judiciary, in the civil service, in the civil society, everywhere they are there. Nobody dares say anything wrong against them because the day they say something, messages will come across and they will be stifled. So the answer is simple. We need to be part of the mainstream. Islam is a mainstream religion. The teaching of Islam is part of the way of life that benefits the society at large. The true message of Islam. And therefore, we have to be in every sphere of the national life of a country. Whether it's in politics, whether it's in civil service, whether it's in the police force, Wherever we are part of it, when you are there, then 
these people who want to attack us will think twice because then we alhamdulillah we are strong our efforts will be coming from different forces and we'll be able to resist and deal with it in much more strategically and a better way jazakallah from the brothers please assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh i am dr nadim and i work in saudi arabia my question to you is brother as per yesterday's talk by brother james e there is gross violations insult and abuse of not only allah subhanahu wa taala but also his religious book that is the glorious quran and prophet muhammad may peace be on him why the world especially the islamic world is silent you mean to say the attack on islam these are the violation of islamic sanctities yes and why is the islamic world silent yes brother this is a very similar to the question posed by our sister earlier on that um, when we not just the community when the muslim countries are weak and where they have lost the sense of direction the iman in allah subhanahu wa taala and the trust in his teachings the holy quran and following the traditions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then we are following other methods other ways and this has proved over the years since the end of the khilafah and many of the countries you would have seen have simply disappeared the answer is very simple when you lose the sense of purpose of your existence you know we should each individually and collectively question there's a purpose of us on this earth why we have been brought in and if we are not able to accomplish that mission of ours then the other issues of being just in the world for the materialistic purposes is temporary so the gain that we suffer will come up to a time when you will enjoy it and then it will disappear but the long term benefits is whether you are individual a community or a country the same principle applies and it is tragic that you are right that somehow there isn't the power the strength to resist or attack or protect yourself against such abuse jazakallah jazakallah khair we have no more time for questions mashallah jazakallah khair for our speaker for such an eloquent talk